I don't think Madonna has had any innocence since she was about five years old. I'm a dodo girl, and I'm looking for my dodo boy. She was the most dedicated, disciplined person I'd ever met. She's a great role model, young girls. Look what you can do if you work hard. I'm everything. Madonna has got this mission to unveil America's puritanism and hypocrisy. Madonna? It seems to be an age of mediocrity, and I think Madonna is way out there in front, leading us all. She is probably one of the most talented women in this country today. The problem with Madonna, she just doesn't know where to stop. I think she's got what she wants, but I think she wants more of it. I am my own experiment. I am my own work of art. Her mother was a beauty from Bay City, Michigan, with the unusual name of Madonna Fortin. Her father was an Italian-American named Silvio Ciccone. Following the birth of two boys, Anthony and Martin, Mrs. Ciccone delivered the daughter she had always wanted on August 16, 1958. She passed on her own first name to the child, who was called Madonna Louise Ciccone. The Ciccones were one of the few white families in this racially mixed Pontiac, Michigan neighborhood called Harrington Hills where they lived in this small house. Little Nani, as her family called her, tended to be the center of attention, but she would soon have to compete for the spotlight, as in the early 1960s, three more children came along in rapid succession, Paula, Christopher, and Melanie. Madonna's brother, Martin, remembers his younger sister as a playful child who got into her fair share of trouble with him. We get along great, right, you know. I mean, we argued, it was sibling rivalry. Anything from, uh, her telling on me when I snuck down to, to get a Fago pop at the store to me putting uh, Vaseline in her hair when she was sleeping, you know, to pay, as the payback. She was kind of a rambunctious, restless kid. She was the type that would always push the limits to any rules that were given to her. There was a special bond between Madonna and her mother. Those who knew her described Mrs. Ciccone as a kind and gentle woman who rarely raised her voice to her children. She was... Um, beautiful and very loving and devoted to her children, very children-oriented. But in 1963, five-year-old Nani's world was shattered when her mother was diagnosed with breast cancer and died within a year at the age of 30. As she grew older, Madonna would try hard to fill her mother's shoes. Madonna kind of assumed the maternal role for my other younger sisters, feeding them, making sure they were dressed, getting them ready for school. I think that had a lot to do with me saying, well, you know, after I got over my heartache, um, saying, well, you know, I'm going to be really strong then. Or if I can't have my mother, I'm going to take care of myself. Madonna played her role as female head of the household until her father married the family's live-in housekeeper, Joan Gustafson, in 1966. Madonna still missed her mother and had a hard time adjusting to the new Mrs. Ciccone. I interviewed Madonna in 1984 and she talked a lot about her stepmother and said that her stepmother liked to dress she and her sisters up in identical outfits. And Madonna just hated that, absolutely hated that. She said she would do anything for some sort of individuality, including wearing the clothes wrong, wearing them inside out, wear, ripping something on them, anything to look different than her sisters. For his part, Tony Ciccone made sure his large family stayed on track by adhering to the principles of regular attendance at church, hard work at school, and strong discipline at home. I wouldn't call it strict. I'd call it conservative. But my father was always a stern believer in, you know, excelling uh, towards leadership and uh, maintaining a competitive edge. And uh, be proud of yourself and uh, pray, do good in school. and. Uh, you will, you, you, will, you will reap the rewards of your investment. Despite all the rules, and perhaps because of them, Madonna's rebellious nature shone through. She went to a strict Catholic school, and she was the first one always to rebel. She would uh, go peek in the windows of the nuns' quarters to see them in their underwear, to see what they looked like without their, their habits, or see if they had any hair. 
She was a good student, however, and always seemed to have an eye on the future. The bitch never had to study, man. Never. Got straight A's. And I, and I used to get up there and study all the time, but my mind wasn't on it. I did it because I was supposed to, and I didn't like it. She did it because she knew that it would get her over to the next phase. Each of the Chicone children studied classical music, but Madonna was more interested in the local Motown sound. Her idols were Diana Ross and the Supremes, Stevie Wonder, Ronnie Spector, and 50s sensation Frankie Lyman, in part because he had a hit single that he wrote at the tender age of 13. In 1969, Madonna's first taste of onstage notoriety came as a result of her bikini-clad talent show dance number, which imitated Goldie Hawn from the popular TV show Laugh-In. Her performance gained Madonna widespread attention at school and a two-week grounding from her dad. In high school, Madonna joined in a variety of activities that would keep her in the public eye. She was a cheerleader, believe it or not, and uh, she also was involved in the theater department. That's where she first got on stage and got a taste of what applause was all about. She was always in the plays, always the center of attention at school, and this really kind of fueled her even further. High school was also a time of discovery for Madonna, of the opposite sex. She always, always had boyfriends. She used to, on the playground of the Catholic school as a child, love to hang upside down on the monkey bars to, so that all the boys could see her underwear. I mean, she loved that. The nuns just really chased her around, you know, constantly getting her to put her dress back down, basically. In 10th grade, Madonna studied jazz dance, but soon outgrew the class. A friend brought her here to the second floor studio of the Christopher Flynn Ballet School. And that's where she really started expressing herself through dance, and this is where she got the idea she was going to become a famous dancer. Madonna's enrollment in the Christopher Flynn School began what became several years of dance study. And while she never became a professional dancer, her friendship with Flynn allowed him to guide her onto the road toward her destiny. During her high school years, Madonna's dance teacher, Christopher Flynn, was tough on discipline and hard work. And while the 16-year-old may have rebelled against those principles at home, she now embraced them at the studio. Christopher Flynn soon became the most influential person in shaping Madonna's dream for the future. Christopher, he was uh, the first gay man that Madonna uh, met. And uh, uh, he took her to the other side, quote unquote, of Detroit, um, so the seedier side, uh, into the nightclubs. And she danced the night away and, and was quite free-spirited and, and learned a lot in a short period of time. After Madonna graduated from high school in 1976, Flynn became a dance professor at the University of Michigan and convinced his young protege to audition for a scholarship there. She did and got it. When choreographer Whitley Satrakian met Madonna in 1976, Whitley was in the market for a fourth roommate to share an apartment in downtown Ann Arbor. I guess my immediate um, impression was one of a combination of fascination and intimidation. What she was beautiful, like? articulate, very, very thin. Her hair had been chopped off in an odd, sort of odd way with little things sticking out on the sides. And she wore lots of heavy dark eyeliner and interesting clothes and, and baggy t-shirts and tight pants and uh, had a way of owning the room when she came in and I'd never really met anyone quite like her. The 17-year-old college freshman struck her roommate as someone who did everything to the fullest. She was up in the morning, out the door, in class before everyone else, warming up. She dragged me out of bed. I, <laughs> I couldn't quite keep up with her. Uh, we'd go out dancing at night on a Saturday night, stay out very late, she'd be up early in the studio to warm up if she had a rehearsal in, on Sunday morning. I never could understand that. She was not easy on herself. She lived hard and, and, and worked very hard. Go ahead, Madonna. Shown here in rare footage of a university dance recital, Madonna was a hard-working student, applying almost single-minded concentration to her dance courses. She soon found her way into Michigan dance professor Gay DeLang's technique class. DeLang remembers her as a standout from the beginning. She had many qualities that young dancers desire. She was lean. She uh, 
had a nice edge to her muscles. She was hungry, great appetite. She was sassy, she was kid-like, chewed gum and lived on Brock's butterscotch candies. She definitely was disciplined, hardworking, uh, a pleasure to be with. She was young, just a kid. In college, Madonna worked off campus to make ends meet. In between jobs, Whitley says she survived by whatever means she could. She taught me how to shoplift. One of us would make a diversion at the counter and you'd place your dance bag slightly under the counter and then sort of lean casually on the counter and then just at the height of the diversion you just sort of go like that and then the fudge would be in your dance bag. During her three semesters at Michigan, Madonna got good grades, but graduating soon became less important than launching her career. She wanted to be a dancer. She wanted to go to New York and get in a good company. On the urging of Christopher Flynn, Madonna took off for the Big Apple to seek her fortune, armed only with $37 and a dream. Ten summers ago, I made my first trip to New York City, my first plane ride, my first cab ride, and I didn't know where I was going, I didn't know a soul, and I asked the taxi cab driver to drop me off in the middle of everything. So he dropped me off in Times Square. Anyway, I was completely awestruck. Arriving in New York City with little more than the clothes on her back, Madonna's survival instincts kicked in. And it wasn't long that very same day that she aligned herself with some, someone on the street and uh, started spieling out her story. Hi, I've just arrived in town. I don't have any place to stay. Next thing she knew, she was in this guy's apartment, staying there, according to her, on the sofa. And this is basically how she lived by her wits in New York. She lived in rat traps, survived by doing odd jobs. In November of 1978, Madonna auditioned for the highly respected Pearl Lang Dance Company. One day she came in with a t-shirt torn all the way down the back and an enormous safety pin. It must have been a foot long holding this together and it was dragged off of one shoulder. And I looked at it and I thought, if she doesn't take the eye out of her partner, she'll do something one day. Madonna was among several chosen that day, but neither a stint with the Lang Company nor a brief workshop with Alvin Ailey were enough to break her into the highly competitive New York dance world. Ironically, it was her offstage dancing that led to a career change. At a party at Pearl Lang's house, Madonna caught the eye of former boyfriend Girl, Norris Burroughs. She had leopard skin, tights on, and she was kind of spinning like a dervish in the middle of the floor. And there were, you know, dancers all around, but it seemed, the sense was that she was in the center. And she was, you know, getting center stage, even though it was a room full of dancers. Burroughs eventually introduced Madonna to his friends Dan and Ed Gilroy who had a band called The Breakfast Club. Usually on the lookout for a place to stay, Madonna wound up moving in with the Gilroys into the old boarded up synagogue they used as a rehearsal hall and living space. There they began to teach her how to play some of the instruments. She learned how to play the guitar, she learned how to play uh, some organ, and they put her behind the drums for a while, but eventually she wanted to sing, and um, Dan and Eddie both sang, so it was like, um, Sometimes she would get up and sing, and they would sing, and, but eventually she wanted to sing more. I think she kind of had found her, you know, her muse, her, her, her idiom. She'd found the, the best vessel for her, her, her drive, and it was being a rock performer. She used to play guitar, you know, and front the band. It was kind of like Band of Gypsies, too, I called it. It was a power trio. And, you know, she'd dance on the tabletops and break up things, and. She didn't smash her guitar. She didn't do that, but she, she did pour champagne all over herself and her guitar on New Year's Eve, so... That was close. I mean, that was her Peter Townshend, I think. It was her ode to the Who. It was a promising start, but while it was music, it was hardly a music career. In the summer of 1979, Madonna was interested in any avenue to stardom. She sent these photos and a handwritten resume to amateur filmmaker Stephen Lewicki, who had placed a local magazine ad which said, Wanted, woman for low-budget movie, no pay. He had an idea for a film called A Certain Sacrifice. It was about, uh, oh, people climbing their way around New York and using each other. And Stephen Lewicki told me there was something about her photos that just made me want to meet her. I had to meet this girl. 
So he met her, they talked. Uh, he decided that she was absolutely the right kind of streetwise, overconfident person that he needed for this role in the film. You can no longer be my slaves. I can no longer be your master. I have other things to do with my life now. Co-star Russell Lome, seen here in one of the film's steamier scenes with Madonna, thought it strange that she used only one name. Stranger still that the novice actress had the air of a diva. She was acting as if she had like a makeup person and a wardrobe person and a whole entourage, and, and there was no entourage. She was just uh, this uh, unknown uh, att but attractive uh, young woman who uh, seemed to command uh, a great deal of attention. Do you think for once that any lover of mine could be tame? It's not possible. Right now they're like, they're like irritating hornets and they want to sting. Unfortunately, neither filmmaking nor music brought in much money. So in order to keep body and soul together, in a move that would later come back to haunt her, Madonna began bearing her body for photographers and artists. In those days, it was uh, $7 an hour. Um, I did a series of drawings of her based on the Sibyls from the Sistine ceiling. She was terrific. She was very good. She was very cooperative, very uh, energetic, very enthusiastic about what she was doing. But what Madonna was most enthusiastic about was music. In 1980, clashes with the Gilroy brothers over the number of songs she wanted to sing resulted in Madonna's leaving the Breakfast Club band and striking out on her own, determined to create her own band and her own sound. After her 1980 falling out with the Breakfast Club band, Madonna moved into a West Side Manhattan conglomeration of rehearsal studios called the Music Building. It would be survival mode once more, as she and drummer friend Stephen Bray took up residence in one of the studios. I never ate out of a garbage can. Uh, I've, I've read that several times. I never actually saw her going through the garbage, but <laughs> it's possible, because we would borrow money to get a sandwich, and we would go and ask for, they'd give us some food at the deli next door to the studio and say, you can pay us when you can. Madonna spent the next year writing new songs and performing locally around New York with a small backup band. In 1981, Madonna met rock manager Camille Barbone, who took an interest, signed her up, and convinced her friend Bill Lamusio to give Madonna a shot. Speaking for the first time on camera, Lamusio says at first he wasn't interested. She let me listen to the tape, and it wasn't anything impressive but uh, she wanted a place for her to try out her live act, and I agreed to let her do the opening for the band. Now, my band was the house band, and they were pretty popular. Out came Madonna and the band, and three uh, break dancers that Camille picked up in Times Square, and proceeded to blow my band off the stage. She really was phenomenal. She was a great talent. You could see it immediately. And after three songs, she was getting called back for encores, and the band that I had was having a hard time getting on the stage. So from that point on, I, I, I asked Camille if she needed a partner on this, and she said, yeah, and we started working together. Madonna and her new backup group made a name for themselves on the local college circuit as a band called Emmy. Uh -huh, we had several names. Emmy, after M, Madonna, and uh, I think we were Modern Dance when I first... <laughs> <laughs> when I first moved there, we were the millionaires at one point. There was a lot of names. When she decided to call the band Madonna, I threatened to quit, though. I thought it was too Catholic, for one thing, and uh, just so maybe a little bit of ego coming out. I don't know. It just seemed like, what about the rest of us? Madonna's popularity began to climb, attracting fans not only to her singing, but also to the second-hand street clothes she wore on stage. Within the next six months, she had a contingent of kids dressing like her and following her from gig to gig. And this is somebody who didn't have a record, who wasn't on the radio. Her managers were impressed with Madonna's success with live audiences. But attempts to impress record executives with her demo tape didn't go as well. One of them even said she sounded on the tape like Minnie Mouse on helium. There was a lot of comments like that, you know, that, oh, you know, the tape was no good. Uh, the, you know, she'll never go anywhere, but that was such garbage. All you had to do was come down and, you know, take a look at her perform live, and that was it. But eventually, word about Madonna's stage presence got around. There were, I would say, no fewer than five labels 
at the dressing room door knocking. Literally, the uh, heads of A&Rs were down there knocking on the door uh, with business cards in their hands. The prospect of success and how to manage it led to infighting. And in 1982, Madonna would once again shed old partners and set off in search of fame and fortune on her own. She survived once again by taking odd jobs around New York City, singing backup vocals for the likes of new wave dance artist Otto von Werner and even heavy metal icon Ozzy Osbourne. She appeared in a music video for a group called Conk. Producer Ed Steinberg remembers Madonna and her best friend Martin Burgoyne as good dancers but camera hogs. And at night, Madonna took her demo tape to Manhattan hotspots like Danceteria, where she tried to convince the trend-setting DJs to play it. Well, the first night I, I said, no, I want to listen to it first, which is always good policy because you never know what someone's given you. And I brought it home that night and listened to it. And the second night, uh, I threw it right on and got an amazing response. As it turned out, it was just another one of Madonna's great pop songs. You know, she writes nursery rhymes for for five-year-olds to grandmothers. Caymans proposed a partnership. If he got her a record deal, Madonna would let him produce her first album. Madonna accepted. Caymans got the tape to Warner Brothers and eventually into the hospital room of Seymour Stein, the president of Warner Distributed Sire Records, who was recovering from heart surgery. I was just vegetating there. When I heard the tape, um, it was a song called Everybody, just a very rough mix of it, and... Uh, I was so excited uh, by it, perhaps partly because of my days in confinement or whatever, that uh, I summoned them both to, to come to the hospital and I wanted to, um, you know, to, to sign her right then and there. When Stein met Madonna, he was quickly convinced she had what it took to be a star. I think if, if I uh, was laying in a coffin but had my hand sticking out and could sign my name, I think that was all right with her. She really was very, very, very anxious to get her career going. She had, you know, she just believed in herself that, that much. Sire Records signed a contract for two 12-inch singles. Assigned to the dance division, Madonna got a $5,000 advance, bus royalties, and $1,000 for every song she wrote. Mark Kamins produced a single of Everybody, which soon proved Stein's hunch correct as it climbed to number one on the dance charts. The record company then sent Madonna on the road to polish her act. And in off hours, she began building what was to become a formidable knowledge of the record business. Found out the dance promotion man was Bobby Shaw, a very talented guy who takes records around to the dance clubs. He used to have meetings in his office every Friday afternoon, invite the DJs. Madonna would sit in, listen to these records, find out the people who made the hits on the dance floors in New York, became friends with them, and utilized the expertise she got from them. Madonna's second single, featuring the songs Burning Up and Physical Attraction, again yielded excellent results. By then, Warner Brothers was ready to greenlight her first album, to be called simply Madonna. It was now time to find a new manager, and as usual, she set her sights on the top, focusing on megastar Michael Jackson's manager, Freddie DeMann. She actually auditioned for him, but right before Madonna was to sign, DeMann had a falling out with Jackson. I was afraid she might be upset about it, and um, she wasn't. Quite to the contrary, she said, listen, now he's free to devote all his time to me. And um, she actually meant it, even though Freddie had other artists at the time, but that's Madonna. The Madonna album was released in July 1983 and boasted an impressive repertoire of songs that were lighthearted and dance-oriented. It yielded the first of what would become a record-breaking 16 consecutive top five singles. Music videos from the album for the first time exposed viewers to Madonna's look, including her top-knotted hair, crucifix earrings, and t-shirt ripped to show off her belly button. Across the country, new fans were captured by Madonna's simple sexiness. She stood out, I mean, especially in a category of a field of music, um, where a lot of records had become, they were hit records, but very few hit artists. But her appearance rubbed some people the wrong way and exposed Madonna to her first taste of real controversy. Many felt her use of crucifixes was sacrilegious, but for others, the crosses became part of a growing Madonna fashion craze. I don't think that the crucifixes were an, 
attempt to seek out controversy. I think that they have meaning for her, religious significance and and mystic significance, and uh, they're they're a talisman for her. Madonna is a very religious person in her in her own way. Young girls, soon labeled wannabes, began imitating Madonna's look from the crosses to the Ray Bans. Department stores devoted entire sections to the ragtag clothing Madonna made famous. Some in the press called Madonna and her look trashy. Many parents were dismayed to find their daughters wearing what appeared to be underwear in public. Underwear as your outerwear um, is only there to titillate men. And believe me, some sicko seen a 14-year-old girl walking down the street in nothing but a lacy bra is not going to stop and say, excuse me, before I grab you, can I talk about what, you're tr what statements you're trying to make? Madonna was unrepentant, refining her look and sound in her second album, Like a Virgin, released in November 1984. Director Mary Lambert would take Madonna to Venice to shoot the title video. We had a great time shooting it. It was really fun. Uh, we went to Venice, and, uh, we, and we had to have a line, so we had a line shipped up from Rome, and the line master was really worried when he saw the crew because he said if anyone had their period the line would eat them and everyone was a woman on the whole thing so I promised him not a chance. <laughs> By early 1985 the Like a Virgin album had sold three and a half million copies in just three months. Madonna and her album received an extra boost with the release of Desperately Seeking Susan. The comedy about a housewife and a street urchin was Madonna's first acting role in a real film. It was originally supposed to be a star vehicle for Rosanna Arquette, and here Madonna, as the accessory character, ends up stealing the entire show. She brought to that role the Madonna that everyone fell in love with, that street-wise, wise-cracking, don't get in my way or I'll walk over you type of street girl. And this was exactly what the role in Desperately Seeking Susan was. Director and crew were pleasantly surprised at Madonna's business-like professionalism on the set. As for co-star Arquette, publicly she posed for pictures and professed to be best friends with Madonna. But privately, she was reportedly furious that her intended star vehicle had been hijacked. While Madonna had learned to weather controversy, she was unprepared for the firestorm of publicity in 1985 when Playboy and Penthouse both rushed to the stands with nude photos dating from her struggling days in New York. Publicly, she shrugged, but privately, she worried. We had watched Penthouse magazine the year before destroy Vanessa Williams' Miss America reign. Now Penthouse was poised again to ruin Madonna's career. Instead of ruining Madonna's career, it was like trying to put out a fire with gasoline. It made her bigger and bigger. And I think she realized right then and there, she was indestructible. Indeed, the controversy further fueled Madonna mania. By the time Warner Brothers sent her out on her first concert tour to promote Like a Virgin, she was well on her way to the superstardom she had always dreamed about. She is your angel this morning, Madonna on Kiss. By the end of 1985, Madonna's albums were selling at the breathtaking rate of over 80,000 a day. Unknown just two years before, she was now the undisputed queen of pop music. And she's new and she's 85. She's it now. She's gorgeous, she can dance, she can do everything. Sexy, sexy. It's like having the new toy in town. You, everyone wants the Cabbage Patch doll at one Christmas and so forth, and she's the Cabbage Patch doll this year. At first, much of the press treated Madonna as a mere flash in the pan. Critics felt the other new pop music party girl, Cindy Lauper, had the real staying power. History, of course, would prove them wrong. I want longevity as a human being. I want it to last forever. Time magazine would give the artist a bit of immortality, putting her on the cover as her highly publicized and successful Like a Virgin tour began. Her show at Radio City Music Hall sold out in a record 34 minutes. One of the songs featured on the tour, Material Girl, was also out on video, featuring Madonna in a send-up of Marilyn Monroe. She was paying homage to a role model. I didn't know her personally, but I admire her. She's an idol. You want to be as big a movie star as she was? Is that important? Like, yeah. While on the set of the Material Girl video, Madonna noticed a young man staring at her. 
Actor Sean Penn was one of a youthful group of stars who had come to be known as the Brat Pack. Intense, moody, with a reputation for drinking, jealousy, and violence, the intensely private Penn may have seemed an odd choice for the outgoing Madonna. They started dating and soon were engaged. My well, opposites attract. The date of the wedding was kept secret, but because it was held outdoors on a hilltop in Malibu, there was no shortage of airborne press coverage, nor speculation that media-savvy Madonna had planned it that way. Here was Sean Penn running around with a gun before the wedding, shooting at the helicopters. Here were the helicopters buzzing the wedding party. Um, all the press outside the house. I mean, it was really the ultimate press release. What better way to get on the cover of Time magazine and People and Life and every other magazine? It's all calculated. Marketing genius, no question about that. Genius or no, at age 26, she had superstar status in the music world, a hit movie, and had just married the man she loved. For once it appeared, the material girl might have everything she wanted. But there would be no honeymoon for Sean and Madonna from the press. The pair traveled to Asia to film Shanghai Surprise, ex-Beatle George Harrison's movie about a missionary in China. But the movie was hopelessly adrift from the start, in part because the pens kept making script changes. During the filming and ever after, they hid from the press. And some of those photographers who persisted got pummeled for their troubles. If the pens had found themselves unprepared for their battle with the paparazzi, they were even less prepared for the battle with the fans. You could see her there. You have to expect a certain amount of, of, a, of an invasion. People walking up to you in the streets. I draw the line when I get to my house. <laughs> People hang out at the bottom of our driveway a lot and constantly ring our doorbell and they want to see us. They think that we're going to invite them up for a cup of tea or something, you know. Seen fighting the press, often fighting each other, they became known as the Poison Pens. Even a conciliatory appearance to promote Sean's movie at close range brought no relief. How much does your appearance here tonight have to do with, with kind of your own feeling to sort of patch up things with the press? Is that, is that part of why you're here? No, the press that has slammed me, I say f*** them. And as far as uh, supporting this movie, that's what I'm here to do. You, re you really have kind of stayed away from public appearances, though, the two of you. They've been busy working. Madonna would dedicate her next album, called True Blue, to her husband, whom she called the coolest guy in the world. Although just as danceable, the songs were now more serious, more passionate, more mature than before. And it was really a, a fantasy situation because we were working for this big label, Warner Brothers, and, and she had gotten to the point that she didn't have to really answer to them creatively, so we were left on our own to make this whole album, and the idea of just doing whatever we wanted and letting them in the room when we finished. That's great. One after another, the singles from the album climbed the charts. But none climbed into the public consciousness as much as the first, Papa Don't Preach, about an unmarried woman who decides to go through with a pregnancy. Madonna had predicted controversy, but now the critical tables were turned. Madonna don't preach, you lose more than Madonna found herself under attack from liberal supporters and championed, although fleetingly, by the right. We saw it as like a Harper Valley PTA kind of a song, and we just liked it. We had good drama appeal to it. I don't think she knew it was going to rock the Vatican. I think that I misunderstood, but I think that's okay. I don't expect everyone to get everything that I'm about. Papa Don't Preach helped boost sales of True Blue over 17 million worldwide. The album benefited, as would many that followed, from controversy, but also from Madonna's new look. Short blonde hair accented what would henceforth remain an incredibly well-toned body. Madonna had hired a trainer and began a relentless exercise program that would ever after have her working out, running and biking for two to four hours a day, seven days a week. Madonna was anxious to revive her film career after bombing in Shanghai Surprise. She settled on a comedy script about a girl let out of prison who goes after the guy who framed her. Originally titled The Slammer, the film's name was changed out of sensitivity to Madonna's husband currently awaiting sentencing on assault charges. In 1987, Who's That Girl would be a song, a movie, and a world tour. I'm standing in the middle of Times Square looking at all you people who've come to see me and my movie, and I am completely awestruck. Snubbed by critics and moviegoers, 
Who's That Girl, the movie, would end up another bomb, but not the concert tour. There were near riots in London. French objections, fearing similar problems, were turned aside when Prime Minister Chirac's daughter persuaded him to intercede. And that drew kisses and a check for AIDS research from the rock diva. Back in the States, in May of 1988, Madonna tried her hand at stage acting, appearing with Ron Silver and Joe Montaigne in David Mamet's dark play about Hollywood called Speed the Plow. It felt like really good sex. <laughs> it didn't feel that way to the critics, however, and she would once again suffer their slings and arrows. But with record ticket sales, the Madonna play, as it had become known, handsomely rewarded its backers. Offstage, during her Broadway run, Madonna took up with earthy and openly bisexual comedian Sandra Bernhard, leading to gossip the two were having an affair. Madonna only half-heartedly denied the rumors. The gossip's most negative effect may have been on her husband, who had been given to several public fits of drunken, jealous rage over her past affairs, both real and perceived. By the end of 1988, events for the Pens would come to a head. Sean hated the fact that his life was suddenly in a goldfish bowl. And this is where the problems lie. Suddenly, he's with what the most high-profile woman in Hollywood, or new arrival in Hollywood, and he just couldn't stand it. They fought constantly. Too much competition. She wanted him to be one way, he wanted her to be the other way, but, I mean, how are you going to do that, you know? How are you going to have two cooks in one kitchen? But I know for sure that she really loved the guy. Their on-again, off-again union finally crumbled when a badly beaten Madonna called out the Malibu Sheriff's Department on Sean. They finally split for good in January 1989, by prenuptial agreement each taking out what resources they had individually brought into the marriage. Friends, however, say that both remained in love with each other. Soon after her split up with Sean, Madonna would be seen in Pepsi commercials, promoting her new single, Like a Prayer. Pepsi spent $10 million on the promotion, half of it going to Ms. Ciccone. Only problem was, Pepsi hadn't seen the music video, which featured a scantily clad Madonna dancing in front of burning crosses and making love on an altar. I felt that it was a song about ecstasy, um, and very specifically sexual ecstasy as it relates to religious ecstasy. We listened to it together and we agreed that it was about ecstasy and then Madonna said she thought she'd like to make love on an altar in the video. This one just evolved. Predictably, Pepsi was not pleased with that evolution and faced with boycott threats from religious groups, canceled the ad deal. Madonna cried censorship, but the press noted she was now five million dollars richer, unfettered by Pepsi cans, and with more than enough brouhaha to launch her new album nicely. To many, it may also have seemed a natural evolution that two of the world's sexiest stars would become lovers. By now, Madonna was hardly a box office booster, but she landed the role of Breathless Mahoney in Warren Beatty's movie Dick Tracy by promising to work for Union Scale, $1,400 a week, and a percentage of the gross. Publicity swirling around the romance between the two stars helped boost the Disney movie, which ended up one of the top films of 1990. Madonna's next film, A League of Their Own, about an all-female baseball league, would win her favorable reviews. But not so her other efforts, which seemed to be largely preoccupied with the subject of sex. The 1990 Blonde Ambition Tour evoked themes of homosexuality, masturbation, and sadomasochism. Toronto authorities threatened to ban the show, but later relented. Not so Italy, which canceled two concerts. The tour exposed fans to a different side of Madonna, now darker and grittier than ever before. I'm very interested in darkness. I'm very interested in street life. I'm interested in the grittiness, the underside of life. The side that isn't so beautiful. The side that isn't so perfect. Truth or Dare, a documentary of the tour, would be one of Madonna's biggest hit movies. Her 1990 single called Justify My Love earned Madonna a coup that had previously eluded her. It was banned from MTV. Madonna once again protested all the way to the bank. 
when she went in to make the video for Justify My Love, she didn't make a video for the purposes of having it banned so it couldn't be shown, so we'd have to release it, and it wound up selling more than any other video in, in history. Um, I think she just believes in what she's doing. Over the next year, the sex theme gathered momentum. A 1992 picture book called Sex, secretively sealed in protective plastic, featured Ms. Ciccone in a variety of explicit nude poses. The book spawned an album called Erotica, the title song of which was played three nights and then yanked from MTV because of its sexual content. Critics and fans alike began to wonder if Madonna had gone too far, if indeed such a thing were possible. I think her message is trash. I think it's demeaning to women. I think it uh, encourages violence, S&M, against women. Um, I think it's an abomination for children to watch her simply because of her message, not her talent. Well, I think Madonna comes out and says, I'm going to expose the hypocrisy of this kind of thinking. Of course women have sexual fantasies, and of course they're not pleasant, sweet, you know, streams flowing by or wind blowing in the breeze, whereas men are perfectly able to have whatever horrible sexual fantasies, as in horror films or pornography or slasher films. You know, nobody really says that much about that. For her part, Madonna had a much more pragmatic explanation. Well, everything does revolve around sex. I mean, look at advertising on television. That's what makes the world go round. I mean, that's, that's not the only important thing, and, and, um, and it's not the only thing, but uh, um, human sexuality is a very important factor in life. Her next movie, Body of Evidence, with Willem Dafoe, came out on the heels of the sex book but failed to materialize as the erotic thriller it was intended to be. Once again, critics would question her acting talent, one calling her career the longest on-the-job training ever. She's, um, she's cardboard. She comes on as an image that we see in still photographs, and she's got to put flesh and blood and bones on it, and we haven't seen that yet. She does use some of her power for the public good as well, especially the fight against AIDS a disease which claimed the lives of her friends Christopher Flynn, Martin Burgoyne, and others. I think the work that she has done to raise money for AIDS shows that she is really willing to put her money where her mouth is in very many instances. And this is where the cold, calculating, use everybody Madonna sort of breaks away and we see that there is a consciousness underneath there. Love her or hate her, Madonna seems to require only that we not ignore her. And whether she has created controversy for the money, or the principal, or perhaps both, Madonna Louise Ciccone became arguably the most famous woman on the planet, leaving an indelible mark upon it. She reaches a lot of people, men, women, straight, gay, black, white, whatever. She's saying, hey, I'm going to be who I want to be, so get it with it, baby, because you can too. I think she's a wonderful, wonderful advertisement for sense and sensibility about sex in an age of AIDS. And I think that's part of what she's trying to get across. And she may have actually influenced a lot of young people in a positive way. I think her biggest fear is being forgotten, not being talked about. And I think that she purposely disappears for several months at a time just to set everyone up for the next whammy that she's got prepared. I think that she's the type of person who would rather see herself burn out at the top than ever diminish in power or fame.